Omicron, abortion at the Supreme Court, and Lauren Boebert. I'm Adam Bierne, and this is The Square Circle. Welcome to The Square Circle. I'm your host, Adam Byrne. Joining us today are Conservative and Newsweek contributing editor, Peter Roth. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hello, Adam. Good to see you. We also have progressive political reporter, James Rosen. Good evening, James. Nice to be here. And rounding off the panel today, we have libertarian Kelly Vlahos of the Quincy Institute. It's been a while. It's good to see you, Kelly. It's great to be back, Adam. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Let's dive right in because this week, the Omicron variant of the coronavirus arrived in the United States. Here's the story from CBS News. A new highly contagious variant, the Omicron variant, is now considered a very high global risk by the World Health Organization. We shouldn't need another wake up call. We should all be wide awake to the threat of this virus. Omicron is already labeled a variant of concern, meaning it could be more transmissible and possibly more virulent. When you look in South Africa, you were having a low level of infection, and then all of a sudden there was this big spike. And when the South Africans looked at it, they said, oh my goodness, this is a different virus than we've been dealing with. So Kelly, it's the first time you've joined us for a while. Let's go to you first on this one. Are we overreacting here or are we taking some sensible precautions? Well, and uh, thanks, and I, I uh, forgive me for being a little rusty on the show. Um, I think yeah. there are people who believe that we are uh, overreacting a bit. Uh, we really don't know what the science of this variant is. Uh, I believe the last I looked, there were two cases in uh, the country. Uh, we're not getting any sense of what kind of uh, harm that this variant is doing in terms of hospitalizations or deaths. I don't think those numbers or that reality is even in yet. Uh, there's been some complaints that, you know, the, the travel restrictions on those uh, S- South African countries were uh, a little heavy handed, seeing that there, those cases are just so few there. Um, and President Biden announced today uh, a whole host of new restrictions, travel restrictions. Now, anybody coming in to the country from uh, and from international destinations will have to have uh, a valid COVID test within one day of departure, uh, so they they can come into this country. Um, the mass mandates are being extended for public uh, transportation, and this has sent obviously the markets tumbling. So we were on this uh, fragile recovery. Uh, that has has been absolutely thwarted with the news over the last three days of this variant. And I think that is um, the worst possible outcome considering the country already suffering uh, from inflation. This is bound to get worse. Janet Yellen, our U.S. Treasury Secretary, said she no longer wants to hear the word transitory when it comes to inflation. Uh, as of today, that is that word is meaningless, she said, and she wants to retire it. James Rosen, let's come to you now. Uh, on these travel restrictions, I see conservatives pointing to progressives' response when former President Trump implemented his own travel bans, and they were decrying it as xenophobic then. So isn't this a xenophobic move from the Biden administration? Well, you know, it's obviously not a xenophobic move where we are uh, not to... Uh, justify the uh, response, the early response of uh, of mainly the Democrats. Uh, but it was, you know, to be honest and blunt, it was an ignorant response. It was at the very beginning of a pandemic, and uh, very few people understood uh, the urgency the, the and the emergency of the pandemic. We're now a year and a half or more into it, it's a totally different situation. Um, I, you know, it was wrong. I, I mean, I, you know, I, President Trump made a lot of mistakes uh, handling the pandemic, but the travel ban was one of the the, uh, the correct moves that he made. It was wrong to call it was xenophobic. 
So obviously it would be wrong to call it xenophobic now. So Peter Roth, is Omicron going to be a, give us a few upsides here in the United States when it comes to our response to the pandemic? Is the Biden administration getting this right? Well, Adam, it's good to be with you again. And I apologize. I appear to have an unstable internet connection. Um, so let me answer briefly. Uh, the Biden administration response to Omicron uh, just highlights how inconsistent their responses are to just about everything. Um, the demand that people traveling to the United States legally all have tests before they come in and the travel bans obviously are not going to be enforced on the U.S.-Mexico border, even though Biden is now adopting the Trump stay in Mexico position that he criticized severely. Anything that encourages people to get vaccinated, I'm generally for. Um, I would not like to see bodies in the streets uh, from people uh, dying from COVID. But if the threat of a Omicron encourages people to be vaccinated, and we've lost Peter, unfortunately. But let's move on because also this week, abortion was again before the Supreme Court. And here's how ABC News covered the story. At the Supreme Court today, the first signs that Roe versus Wade's days may be numbered. Outside the court, protesters gathered, while inside, the justices heard arguments on that Mississippi law that bans most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, no exceptions for rape or incest. Roe versus Wade established a woman's constitutional right to have an abortion, and if the court upholds the Mississippi law, it would undermine or overrule Roe altogether. Today, it seemed clear the conservative justices are ready to do exactly that. So, James Rosen, let me come to you. What did you make of the arguments before the Supreme Court this week? How do you feel the case is going to go? And what impact do you think it's going to have on the country? Well... You know, uh, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a legal expert. Um, I think there's a, a better chance of uh, the, the, the historic uh, 1973 Roe v. Wade decision being not overturned, but restricted um, uh, for the first time since then, really, uh, by, by the Supreme Court, um, with this, with, given the makeup of the court. Uh, I, I think that uh, if there are, you know, I mean, you know, one one possibility is that they will simply leave it up to the states, and then you'll have you'll have states largely up to the states, and then you'll have um, you know some states outlawing abortion, essentially outlawing abortion with some exceptions, and and other states uh, allowing it. And we'll be back where we were before Roe v. Wade, where uh, people who live in, uh, let's call them non-abortion states, will have to travel, you know, either have very risky illegal procedures or travel to states where abortion is uh, legal. But I, I think if the Supreme Court, um, you know, uh, Justice Roberts, um, had, Chief Justice Roberts, has shown himself to be aware in, in other high-profile controversial rulings. He has shown himself to be very sensitive to the, the legacy of the court, the image of the court, and I think to some, uh, even though he's not supposed to, to the, some political ramifications. And I think the political ramifications of this decision are so huge that if Roe B. Uh, B. Wade is struck down or if the restrictions are too great, I think you're going to see huge protests by, you know, the, 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 the fa by now famous uh, suburban moms. Not that all suburban moms are pro-abortion, but you're going to see street protests by a lot of women who have never protested before. And I think Chief Justice Roberts is well aware of that. Uh, it's something he doesn't want to see. He doesn't want to see the Supreme Court in the middle of a political debate and that will factor in his decision. So I can't predict how they will rule, um, but it's certainly, whichever way they rule, it will be an, an awfully important and potentially historic ruling. And Peter Roth, I saw you shaking your head there, disagreeing with James' analysis of how this case went. 
Well, it's not my analysis that I was disagreeing with. It was his understanding of the law. Roe v. Wade established the trimester system um, for uh, monitoring pregnancies. And if it's in companion case, Doe um, legalized abortion up through the ninth month through, um, frankly, labor and delivery. In the Webster case, they were narrow. And in Planned Parenthood Federation of America versus Casey, they were narrowed. Um, James said that they've never been narrowed before since Roe. That's not true. We know when fetal heartbeats begin. We know when fetal pain begins. We also have seen a tremendous shift in national attitudes about abortion. What I suspect here is that the court will probably defer to Mississippi's right to narrow the time frame in which a woman can get an abortion to six weeks, as the Mississippi law um, suggests. I do not think they are going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Uh, part of the reason, though, that we have lifetime appointments to the Supreme Court is to free the court of concerns about the politics of the nation. And in that regard, I think that Justice Sotomayor's comments from the bench were disgraceful. Um, they were loaded with political concerns. OK, and Kelly, you're the only woman on our panel, so I'm very, very keen to get your opinion. But I just want to let James respond to Peter's attacks there very quickly. If you can, please, James. You know, anybody who has read histories, you know, uh, serious histories of the Supreme Court knows that uh, throughout the Supreme Court's history, uh, they, they have always paid some attention to politics. They don't want to see riots in the streets. It was one of the reasons why, if you read the history of their famous uh, Bush v. Gore decision, the 5-4 decision stopping the recounts in Florida in 2000, it was one of, it was one of the concerns of several justices. They, they have, on big, big controversial cases, they have often throughout their history, to some degree, taken po uh, the political situation into account. So yes, technically they're not supposed to, but historically they do. Okay, Kelly, same question to you. How did you see the arguments at the court? Where do you think the justices might rule? And what effect do you think it could have on the country? I mean, I agree with both the, the my fellow panelists here that oh. it will probably come down to uh, Justice Roberts' uh, inclination to in, in incrementalism and will likely not be fully overturned, but a narrowing from the 24 weeks that I feel, I, I believe is the current standard of, of viability of the fetus uh, to maybe the 15. And that will probably start a whole new slew of lawsuits coming down the pike. Finally, another Republican member of Congress is in trouble this week for remarks about a Democratic member. This time, Colorado Representative Lauren Boebert made what is considered to be anti-Muslim comments towards Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar. Bobert later issued a partial apology, but a phone call between her and Omar ended with the latter hanging up. So, Peter Roth, what should the Republican Party be doing about these comments from Lauren Bobert? I'm assuming that you agree that they are anti-Muslim, Islamophobic, xenophobic, call it what you like. Well, it's clear that Mean Girls doesn't stop in high school. That's, that's the start. Um, you know, and if Mrs. Pelosi did his, was, was expected to police the comments made by members of her caucus about Republican members, I'd be a little bit more concerned. I mean, this is, this is, this is nasty, but you know what? Mrs. Mrs. Omar has said an awful lot of nasty things about the United States that have offended me. Um, she said, have they been racist? Things. Were they racist remarks? Were they xenophobic? Um, I, I don't, well, yeah, they were they were xenophobic in the sense that she was speaking as a Somalian attacking America, as opposed to a member of the United States Congress from Minnesota representing the people of Minnesota. So, yeah, I think they were kind of xenophobic. Um, she was attacking the country that accepted her as a political refugee. So, yeah, I think that's kind of xenophobic. I think that's offensive. Um, I, I have no truck with anti-Muslim bigotry, and I think I have a long record of defending the rights and freedoms of Muslims in the United States, just as I have a long track record of defending the rights and freedoms of other religious groups. Um, but, you know, this is, this, is, this is part and parcel 
to the idea that there are no enemies on the left. They're all on the right. Um, Mrs. Omar should have been disciplined for her remarks. Um, You have you have other uh, other members, Mrs. Talab from Michigan, who said offensive. And I would I would argue are 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 at least veiled racist comments about Jewish Americans. Um, You have uh, members of Congress uh, who have said horrible things about Republicans and and it's reported in the news, but nobody calls them on the carpet for it. If I were in charge, I would order Mrs. Boebert to to take Mrs. Omar to her congressional district and to show her around and to introduce her to her voters. And then I would order Mrs. Boebert to go to Mrs. Omar's district and be taken around and be introduced to her her voters and learn about their concerns so that we can get to some degree of mutual understanding and get back to the business of things that are important in America, like creating jobs, growing the economy, strengthening the national defense, and making sure that our First Amendment rights are not stripped away by the politically correct police. Kelly Vallejos, should we just let these comments go, maybe try and build some consensus instead, or should some action be taken here? I mean, I, in this political environment, I don't know what action is going to be taken that's actually going to be effective. Um, and, and Peter, I'd have to ask you a procedural question. I mean, that can the House strip uh, Lauren Boebert's committee assignments, or does they do they have does that come under what Kevin McCarthy that his purview is it the is the majority Nancy of the Pelosi, House doing? Nancy Pelosi could could get a motion on the floor, and they would make a determination by majority vote on to whether or not Mrs. Boebert would be stripped from her assignments. That's what they did to Marjorie Taylor Greene for things that she said while she wasn't a member of Congress. Right. James, what was your view on this? Our, your fellow guests seem to be split on what should be done about this. Well, I, you know, I, I don't think uh, 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 stripping committee assignments of, of someone like Con- Congresswoman Boberg, is that how she says her name, um, or, or Congresswoman Green, I, I don't think that punishes them one bit. In fact, I think that elevates them uh, to martyrs and heroes with their base. I think they raise more money off of it. I think they, I think they, and they don't care. I mean, you're on committees to pass legislation. They don't give a darn about passing legislation. That's not why they came to Washington. They didn't come to legislate. So it's a, not only is it a hollow punishment, it's a punishment that they like. So, uh, and as far as I, I just get tired of the media being a punching bag and that, you know, we're completely one sided and we ignore outrageous things, um, uh, you know, that the Democrats do. I mean, Al, Al, it's a different sort of issue, but it was tied to Me Tooism. I mean, Al Franken was, in my opinion, prematurely hounded from the, one of the most liberal senators, was hounded from office, and the media played a big role in that in amplifying what he had done or hadn't done, made him resign because of a, alleged, you know, improprieties. And there's a lot of other examples I could give. So, I, you know, it's, it's kind of intellectually lazy to just go around saying that the media only ignores one thing, one side and doesn't uh, and, 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 and only focuses on uh, on the other. And by the way, Congresswoman Omar um, was strongly criticized. Uh, uh, you can read the editorial. Some of the things she said, uh, she was rightly or wrongly strongly criticized. So the notion that she hasn't been criticized is just not true. Okay, and, and Peter, let's just wrap this one up. What does this say about the Republican base that a member of Congress can go in front of the base supporters, donors, and raise money and get laughs off the back of Islamophobic remarks? I, I have a, I have a problem with calling the remarks Islamophobic, I think that it cheapens jihad, the real so, hate. So using the word there. jihad squad, um, using a specifically Muslim term to poke fun at her is, is not Islamophobic yeah, or xenophobic. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't necessarily think that that, that constitutes Islamophobia. Islamophobia is burning down a 7-Eleven that's run by um, a family of Sikhs because you think they're Muslims. Islamophobia is attacking Muslim people in the street 
and beating them just because of what they look like or, or saying that they can't speak. I don't, I don't, I'm not offended by Jihad Squad. I don't embrace it. I don't think it's a particularly wise thing to say, but, you know, we live in a free speech culture. Um, and For, you know, forgive me, it almost again, sounds like I, you're saying that speech can't be racist at all. No, speech can be racist. I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's racist. I mean, look, who were the guys on the airplanes that flew into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon? They were radical Islamists. That's, that's, that's just a fact. It may be an unpleasant fact, but it's just a fact. I don't think that it's helpful to keep bringing it up. I certainly don't think that it's helpful in terms of making the honest, hardworking Muslim American men and women who came to this country seeking greater political, economic, and religious freedom, or who are descendants of people who did, um, to make them feel any more welcome and to make them feel any um, any happier, but but you know to, to to throw around words like Islamophobia is is like throwing around words like homophobia or other kinds of phobia to to separate it out as though it's a special kind of evil that demands condemnation. Its stupidity is what it is. I mean, James is that, correct that, that Omar was, James that, is correct that, that, that Omar was criticized, but. You know, she wasn't stripped of her committee assignments. There's no effort underway to drive her from office. I, I was going to try and move on, but I can see that both James and Kelly want to say one more thing on this. Uh, James, should we go to you first and then Kelly, and then we'll move on if we can. Well, I mean, I, I just, I, I just, you know, I just, um, you know, Peter has made some valid points, but his basic argument is, well, you know, the Democrats do it too. So, and, and they have a double standard and the media has a double standard, which I don't think is true. Uh, media likes a good story wherever it comes from, a sensational story wherever it comes from. And, and Kelly, uh, your last thoughts then on this topic? Yeah, I mean, I am I am the last person that can be accused of, uh, you know, taking one side over the other or ignoring um, the transgressions of the other side. Uh, I am an independent thinker. And so when I do hear um, progressives and Democrats attacking Republicans unduly, whether it be over Second Amendment rights or Trumpism or what have you. I'm the first to call it out. I'm calling this out because if she was not wearing a hijab, if Rashid Talib was not an open Muslim, if these women were not Muslim, you would not be calling them proto-suicide bombers. And the fact is that that is Islamophobic because you don't like their progressive values. You don't like the issues that they defend. You don't like them criticizing Trump. You don't like them criticizing uh, war policies and sending uh, uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia. Fine, attack them on the issues. But because she's wearing a hijab, it all becomes about her Muslim identity. And that is Islamophobic. And to say that there's no repercussions or the harm is not that bad, I listened to those recordings of her getting death threats. And yes, I know there are plenty of Democrats and that, you know, and Republicans that get death threats every day. But I listened to them. And as an American and as a human being, I said, there's something wrong there because. The, the fact is this country has been dealing with Islamophobia since 9-11. And we know that there are millions of people out there that, would, that had turned on their fellow Muslims after 9-11. And these are dog whistles when you talk about things in these terms. And so I vehemently disagree with Peter on this issue. It is harmful. It is Islamophobia. And if you, you're in the right on the issues, then attack her for her policies, but don't attack her for her hijab. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Let's, let's move on there then if we can. And it's time to take some questions from our viewers and listeners. And the first one is returning, it seems, to our first topic on Omicron. And it's Judy Lopez, and Judy's asking, why did the administration ban foreign travelers but allow U.S. citizens to come home? 
are Americans somehow incapable of transmitting the virus? James, should we go to you on that? Well, I mean, (laughs) that's a fair question. Um, I suppose Americans have uh, travel rights, uh, especially when they're when they're overseas, uh, that uh, non-Americans don't have. Uh, foreigners trying to come into this country. I suppose there's a difference there, but I, you know, I think that's a fair question. And, uh, you know, as other panelists have, have said, states have greatly limited, limited, uh, our, our freedom of movement the last year and a half, some states more than others with, 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 you know, lockdowns that almost kept us in our homes. I, I, I do want to get to back to New York and vaccination quickly and say that, and say that it's it's not a New York City um, it's not New York City uh, which is imposing um, I'm sorry which is has imposed this uh, uh, ban it's it's a statewide ban and um, and there are large parts of New York up in the north which um, are, have not been vaccinated like New York City. Peter, do you have some quick thoughts on this one? I would just say that the optics for the Biden administration of keeping citizens out because of Omicron, of Omicron and not closing the border um, between Texas and Mexico would be death for this administration. And Kelly, your thoughts on Judy Lopez's question? I don't have anything more to add. OK, well, we are starting to run out of time, but of course, we want to get to our regular segment. And uh, when each of our guests are going to tell us what they think the most underreported story of the week is and who would like to go first. Kelly, come on. You've not been here for a while. Go first. (laughs) No one likes to. No one ever likes to jump in. But Kelly, go ahead. Okay, so I had written about this. So I guess it was reported, but it wasn't well reported. Uh, The the Reagan Foundation and Institute had come out with a poll recently that found that Less than 50%, 45%, in fact, of Americans uh, feel that they have a great deal of trust in the military. That's 45%. Uh, That is down from 70% two years ago. Uh, It's down from 56% just, you know, uh, six months ago. Uh, There is a big crisis going on uh, with our institutions, and the military was always the institution that the Americans trusted the most. I think this is a result of 20 years of failed war policy, the betrayal by our senior leadership in the military, the over-politicization of the military, um, the withdrawal from Iraq, which I agreed with, but the botched withdrawal, the actual um, withdrawal in September, all of that have have culminated in a real plummeting of, of faith in, in the military. And there, there's got to be some reckoning there. I don't know what it is, but it, it's pretty bad. Okay. Peter Roth, your most underreported story this week. Uh, to me, it's that the New York Mets signed pitcher Max Scherzer to a deal that's worth more than the payroll of the Baltimore Orioles, which points out how sports salaries are getting out of control and how small market clubs are having difficulty surviving, which threatens to ruin America's national pastime. Thank you for that one, Peter. Just as a Washington Nationals fan, I'm just shaking my head just generally. James Rosen, bring us home with your most underreported story this week. Well, this is something that I found fascinating. Uh, There was, in the 1950s, there was an economic theory that emerged that ended up winning the Nobel Prize for economics on um, uh, that investors have used on how to make smart investments and choose the right stocks. It's very technical, uh, but basically it it, it ends up, uh, it's kind of like a risk analysis theory uh, and it's been used successfully to make, to buy good stocks. And now scientists are using the same sort of approach and the similar theory to decide which coral reefs, uh, can best survive and should be saved and which coral reefs can't be saved. I won't go into the connection between those two. I'm not as brilliant as, as, as the scientists and the economists, but I find that fascinating. Well, anything that saves the coral reefs is all right by me. But that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching or for listening, whichever you've been doing. I'm Adam Beer. This is The Square Circle. We'll see you next week.